can hear you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, and good morning or afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, I'm Eduardo Trigo. Um, I'm a special advisor to the Director General of uh, IICA, the International Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture. And I will be moderating this uh, uh, producer public forum. And, and it's, uh, it's great to, to have you all uh, today. Uh, really great because um, being the, the, the Food Summit being a, a people's uh, meeting with the farmers uh, at the center of the discussion, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really important to, to have this public forum uh, concentrating on, on agricultural producers' perspectives. Uh, before we start, I would like to draw your attention to a few logistical issues, which will be important to, to organize our meeting today. And I will read not to leave anything uh, uh, anything out. The first participants are welcome to introduce themselves in the chat box. Uh, here the issue is that um, we have a large number of attendees and this is event not set up as a meeting but it's in the webinar format so please uh, in the chat box please in introduce uh, yourself. Uh, at the same time we are kindly asking you to post your questions in the Q&A box where all the panelists and attendees can see them. We'll be monitoring the session and we'll do our best to answer these questions in the Q&A box and at the end of the presentations. Uh, before, before, because of the limited capacity, we can only take questions that are posted in the Q&A box. The Q&A box is uh, next to the raise hand um, symbol uh, at the bottom uh, of your screen. Um, uh, only take questions uh, that are all posted in English uh, uh, and the Q&A box. We will also try to answer some of these questions verbally. Uh, you are welcome to upvote a question so that we are able to choose questions uh, for verbal response. Uh, where we are not able to answer the questions on the moment or in the Q&A box uh, or in the Q&A box, we will follow up in the next weeks with a not, note about the question uh, to all attendees. Please note that all of the presenters uh, will speak in English and that the verbal part of the forum uh, will be interpreted in two different languages, which you can choose uh, either Spanish or Portuguese uh, at the bottom of, of the screen. Um, now, um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Agnes uh, Calibata, uh, who uh, will uh, kind of do the formal welcome uh, to the meeting, let me um, sort of give you a brief glimpse of the, our agenda today. Uh, after the, um, Dr. Scalibata, the introduction, uh, we will have a presentation, a global presentation, and then a specific presentation on each of the action tracks, uh, each of the five action tracks on which the uh, Food Summit is uh, it's organized. Uh, and then we will have an update of the situation of the dialogues, and then uh, we'll sort of closed up with ample time uh, for discussion and question and answers. Um, so without further ado, uh, I will introduce uh, Dr. Calibata, uh, who is the, um, the special envoy uh, of the Secretary General of the United Nations for the organization of the Food Summit. Uh, Dr. Calibata, it's a it's a well known um, it's a, it's a well known agriculturalist who has had an extensive uh, career both in her country and uh, throughout Africa and other international positions. And um, I will welcome uh, Dr. Kalibata to to introduce, to open uh, this meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalibata.
Eduardo, um, Dr. Calabat has been delayed. My suggestion is you go straight into the panel uh, presentation. Okay. Over. It's um, it's Martin here. Well, not yet. Um, Dr. Calabat has been delayed uh, uh, in in another meeting. Uh, there is just one too many meetings in. Uh, in these days uh, around uh, such an important activity as the food summit and unfortunately she's been delayed so to, to make a good use of the time we'll go directly into the um, into the uh, into the action tracks and I will buy Dr. Martin Frick who's the, the deputy special envoy uh, from the to, uh, to, to the summit uh, to provide an, uh, an overview of the of the action tracks. Um, uh, Martin, please. Hi, Eduardo. Um, Martin will come a bit later. Um, I think okay. we want to go into the the panel discussion. Um, uh, okay. Um, so uh, since uh, we had this little sort of problem here we'll um we'll um invite uh, um Eduardo, let's have um and to start with the with the with an opening speech first as the um, as the agenda we can have um agnes be with us once um, she is um, available for the meeting. Let's have N. Okay. Uh, so we'll invite uh, um, this is Anne um, Mace, um, who's the chairwoman of the U.S. Farmers and, and Ranchers Association, um, to to provide a um, a welcome and introduction. Um, from the producer uh, group's uh, perspective. Uh, Anne, please. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, it's a real honor to be here, and I will just echo what you said earlier about how very important it is to have the producer voice when we talk about food, because it all starts with food. Uh, because food all starts with the producer and the farmer on the ground. So it's a great honor to be here representing farmers and ranchers from across the United States. I am Ann Meese, and I'm a farmer from Elgin, Nebraska, where my husband Jim and I farm with his family on our fourth generation farm. Like many farms here in the Corn Belt, we raise corn, soybeans, and cattle. Springtime on our farm means this intense pace to get those seeds in the ground in a timely manner. In fact, I just returned from the field where I filled the planter with soybean seeds so my husband can continue planting. Like every farmer around the world, once those seeds are in the ground, we're hoping for rain and favorable weather for the growing season. The corn and soybeans grown on our farm will be used for livestock feed, and biofuels here in the United States, or possibly the grain will find its way on a ship to destinations like China or the Philippines. Our high quality beef raised here on our rangeland can be found on tables in Japan, Hong Kong, or other parts of the world. I was fortunate to travel on trade missions to Japan where I witnessed firsthand Nebraska beef at Japanese supermarkets. And I have seen ships filled with soybean meal at ports in the Philippines. We're proud to produce products that are exported to many countries. We are rich in soil here in this sparsely populated breadbasket of the United States. And this healthy soil produces enough food to export to the many ends of the world. I do currently serve as chairwoman of U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action, and I'm also a board member for the Nebraska Soybean Checkoff Board. 
U.S. Farmers and Ranchers, or USFRA, represents farmer and rancher-led organizations and about 54 farmer groups, representing 1.6 million farmers, as well as other leaders across the agriculture sector. With this shared vision of co-creating a sustainable food system and a belief that bold action is needed, our organization exists because we see a tremendous opportunity for farmers and ranchers to provide solutions to climate change. Over the last two years, USFRA has worked hard to advance a common vision for the future of agriculture sector. We believe action toward the UN Sustainable Development Goals starts with agriculture and that we can be part of the solution for our communities and the planet. And that's why this vision for the next 10 years is called the Decade of Ag. We believe in the Decade of Ag, and that calls for a decade of action. We now have 44 CEOs from across the food and agriculture sector endorsing the Decade of Ag vision and its desired outcomes. And together, we're on this mission to bring agriculture together for this common purpose. We know these goals are important. For years and generations as farmers, we practice stewardship, the values and commitment to leave the land better for the next generation. Sustainability is about all of us putting our values to work to make the business model work. That is going to take a lot of hard work and commitment on behalf of the sector. And it is our sincere hope that farmers will have a distinct and independent voice in these dialogues. So I want to thank the UN for recognizing that farmers and ranchers need to have this voice in the dialogue as we discuss solutions to climate change. We have a very unique perspective to share. We have experience on the land that others do not. Our work can help serve as solutions to know. climate change. Often Ooh. the conversation about agriculture is about emissions, but what is overlooked is the power of our soil, the rich black soil that we work every day on our farm. When I look out over my land, I see natural rangeland where cattle graze, and I see crops providing food and fiber and fuel. And I know that what is below my feet is truly an untapped asset. As a farmer and rancher leader, I'm honored to be included in these conversations. And I'm also humbled by the realities that we face as farmers and ranchers in the next decade. We need partnerships and we need solutions. And I look forward to the discussion panel today. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much, Anne. Um, I would like um, in call on uh, Jens Messer, uh, who's the uh, executive president of uh, Fede Palma, uh, a farming organization uh, specialized in of uh, of oil palm farmers in in Colombia, uh, to present to give a presentation. Uh, introducing the, their their perspective on the uh, on this on the summit. Uh, please, uh, Jens, uh, you have the floor. Uh, remember that you have five minutes. Uh, please, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Trigo. Uh, good morning to all. I hope uh, you are all safe and fine. I want to thank the organizers of this summit for inviting me to this important event. I am also grateful with IICA for thinking of me as a speaker for this forum. Next slide, please. Is someone going to help me to pass the slides, please? Thank you. Since 2089, I am honored, oh, 2019, I am honored to be an ICAS Goodwill Ambassador. And I share 
its interest on developing a competitive and sustainable agriculture for 32 years. Uh, please go back. Uh, uh, okay. I think we are missing the, the, the slides, please. Okay, if you leave it there, please. For 32 years, I have represented the National Federation of Oil Palm Growers of Colombia, Fede Palma, as executive president. Next slide, please. Based on this experience, I'm pleased to share with you some thoughts about sustainable agri-food systems and about how Colombia oil palm agroindustry is committed to sustainability. Next slide, please. Please, next slide. Next, next slide, please. Uh, leave it there, please. I would like to begin by highlighting the global population trends that point out the increasing of calories intake requirements of food demand. In this scenario, vegetable oils are key goods to fulfill these needs, and among them, palm oil is by far the leading product. This market condition is due to its particular property. Next slide, please. First, oil palm is the most efficient crop to provide vegetable oils based on a lower use of land and other resources, such as energy, fertilizers, and pesticides. Oil palm plantations generate 10 times more oil than soybean and five times more oil than rapeseed. Next slide. On the other hand, palm oil serves multiple purposes beyond food production. Energy with uses on biofuel and energy generation, personal care and cosmetics, animal feed, among others. Next slide, please. We are aware about negative past experience with palm oil production in some regions and probably some of you have a bad perception of this agro-industry, but it is possible to provide a sustainable sourcing of this vegetable oil, and Colombia has become a good example of that. Next slide. Colombia oil palm agro-industry is committed to environmental, social, and economic sustainability. Currently, deforestation linked to oil palm crops in Colombia is point oh four percent according to official sources in addition the zero deforestation agreement for palm oil chain is in force this sector creates decent and good labor conditions and promote inclusive businesses models that positively impact communities the development of oil palm plantations contribute to higher health and education coverage rates in surrounding communities Additionally, in Colombia, the success of the oil palm in illicit crop substitution programs have been proven. Finally, I would like to highlight that the sector has been working on a national initiative to consolidate and position our sustainable Colombian palm oil as a unique and differentiated product. Of course, the challenge of developing a competitive and sustainable agro-industry only can be overcome if producers and supported by suitable public policies that foster productive investment. This must be priority for every country and government to design and implement effective policies and measures to boost sustainable agri-food system. Next slide, please. I would like to share a final insight. Colombia has potential to become major food supplier to the world. Next slide, please. Our agricultural frontier is over 40 million hectares, and we are spending less than 20% for agricultural systems. As producers and the main pillar of food system, we need to get involved proactively to generate ideas and proposals consistent is a big opportunity to do so. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jens. 
Uh, we have had now uh, two perspectives uh, from the farming community of uh, the Americas. And um, we'll now uh, go to the next uh, um, segment of the agenda, uh, which is uh, which are the, the presentation of the action tracks. And uh, for that, uh, each of the action tracks, and, and for that, I will ask uh, Martin Fried, who is the Deputy Special Envoy uh, to the, from the sec uh, Secretary General to the Food Summit uh, to make a brief uh, interview, uh, inter uh, introduction, uh, provide an overview uh, of, uh, of progress uh, with the action tracks, uh, then to move to a short presentation on, on each uh, of the action tracks. Martin, please. Martin, you may be on mute. And if I unmute myself, I am much better to understand. So let me start again. Um, I started off by um, expressing an apology for being late here. There was a meeting with the Deputy Secretary General who is sort of the chairman of our board for the Food Systems Summit. But I'm happy to report that producers, farmers, herders, fisher folk, we're at the heart of our discussions because this is an SDG summit and we really do not want to leave anyone beyond behind. And this is why um, in the action track process, the main focus was really around inclusivity. This is not a negotiated summit, but this is a listening summit. This is a people summit. And we've been starting off the action tracks um, with basically asking the entire world for their solutions. And Oliver, if you can run the slides, please. Thank you. Um, let's go to the next one. So here are our five action tracks around ensure access to safe and nutritious food for all, about shift to sustainable consumption patterns, um, a boost to nature positive production at scale, advance equitable livelihoods, and build resilience to vulnerabilities, um, shock and stress. Can I have the next slide? Um, this is how the process was being run so far. Um, we have two waves of input. For the first wave of input, we cut at mid-February and looked at more than 1,200 ideas received by all um, walks of global society, by member states. Of course, this is a UN process. Member states um, are in the driver's seat, um, but we have received more than 400 ideas by producer organization, indigenous people, and by civil um, society. So we have been looking at these solutions with a sense, if I may say, of humility and respect. We are not eliminating solutions, but we are looking at those, bringing together similar solutions, checking where synergies can be built and have thus been able to reduce to a little bit more of 107 um, game-changing propositions. You can find those on the foodsystems.community website. I will put the web resource um, into the chat box, or maybe somebody from the team can do that, where you can check all of these solutions and most importantly, comment on those. Now, we kept our gates open for a second round of um, asking for ideas for game-changing propositions. And again, we have, we are still counting, we have almost received the same number. So we are now way above 2,000 um, solutions to be found. So how do you make sense of those? How do you turn that into an action summit? Can I have the next slide? And this is how it looks like. We have as the foundation of our pyramid more than 2000 ideas collected from all over the world. And it's everything. It is about land restoration, soil improvement, holistic grazing, how you rebuild 
um, degraded land using livestock, for example. But it's also about policy approaches, about school feeding, about financial instruments. So this, as I have said, we have um, tried to compress into about 100 quality propositions that we really feel encompass the complexity and the diversity of food systems. Because of course, there is not one size fits all. And we have been using our five action tracks, which I just mentioned, as hosts for 15 action areas um, that would, should really look after the game-changing propositions. And I should be saying that all of these 15 action areas are indeed cross-cutting. In every single one, you will have people from different action tracks bringing the elements together. I was mentioning, for example, livestock as a way to restore degraded land with holistic grazing and management of land. Now, this, of course, is a nature positive way because it brings back um, land into arable use. It sequesters carbon. It builds up biodiversity. It builds up the water tables of land. So it's also a livelihood solution. It builds resilience. It increases the access to food. And our prime goal, of course, is to fight hunger, which is the worst violation of human rights that um, we can imagine. So if I can have the next slide. This is now where we are at. You have the five action tracks. Under each action tracks is a series of areas of action. And these are now becoming operational. And we need help. We need all hands on deck. And I would really invite everyone um, to help us realizing those. If you have the different areas, for example, slashing food loss and waste, which we all feel deeply about. There are hundreds and hundreds of initiatives around there. There are young people programming apps for a smartphone where you can donate um, leftover food, which hasn't been sold in a supermarket, let's say by Saturday evening, to homeless people and so on. We want these areas of action to be the meeting grounds for action. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And this is our timeline. We are constantly consulting. And we are not, as I said, we are not negotiating a piece of text, but we are consulting with member states, with all walks of global society, constantly asking, did we get it right? Can we hone our proposition? Is that something that we find people who are prepared um, to lean in, in order to build up to the pre summit where we will show this whole menu of options, hopefully with many people participating and a possibility for heads of states and government when we come to the September summit moment um, to declare what they are prepared to do nationally to make their food systems more equitable, more fair, more sustainable, and hopefully also big coalitions of actions with countries, but beyond with academia, with companies, with um, producer associations, and so on. So thank you very much for being here. And I will put more information in the chat box so we can continue the discussion digitally online. Thank you very much. And back to you, uh, Dr. Trigo. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, and then we will uh, start moving uh, into the, the sort of the specific of the of the of the of the summit the summit discussions, which are the action track. And uh, we'll ask uh, Dr. Samuel Benning, um, to the deputy division director of Africa Regional Office uh, at IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute. Um, to to make his presenta presentation about uh, action track one, uh, which is about uh, ensuring access to safe, safe food and nutrition for all. That is uh, in the in the Dr. Benny, please. Thank you, thank you, Eduardo, and also um, Martins is a very good um, 
overview into, into this um, um, action track. So next slide, please. Um, so the, in, in, this action, in this action track, as, as, the, as the heading suggests, ensures access to safe and nutritious food for all. Within it, there are three goals or three sub goals that our working groups, we have working groups organized around. And I am co-lead of one of the working groups. And uh, so basically looking at ending hunger, um, nutrition, and also um, food safety. And so as uh, Martin showed, the, these have become the, the three action areas that, that were organized around. And Eduardo in introduced me um, in, in my capacity, I do provide um, support to implementation of the comprehensive agriculture Africa development program. And, and so I'm bringing some of that in, into this. Next, next slide, please. So what we have done so far is collecting the ideas in both wave one and wave two, as Martin said, which we have organized them under these three action areas that correspond to the sub, to the sub goals of the, of the action track. Promote food security and reduce hunger, improve access to nutritious food, and also make food, food safe. So basically what we are doing now is clustering those, um, those um, game-changing solution and ideas into uh, what, what will become the, the clusters on which we will develop uh, proposals further towards the pre-summit and also the summit. Next slide, please. And so this, this slide here gives you an overview of, of where we are at um, in, terms of the, in terms of clustering. And basically, I just want to highlight the action area 1.1, which is promote food security and, and hunger. And so there we have these two clusters which um, have direct um, implication for, for this forum in terms of um, um, producers. So one is um, providing access to small safe, small scale technology for smallholders and also empowering smallholders. But basically in the other um, clusters also, there will be um, um, areas that would have some indirect, indirect actions as well. So most of my, uh, my time will be spent on the, on the next slide. And so to emphasize those two, those two that I said, basically this um, slide gives you an idea of the game um, changing solutions that have come both from, from wave one and wave two. The ones that have um, parentheses two to them means that these are with two um, ideas. So as you can see, there are lots of them that are in, in the with two ideas because when we started the process in the with one, under, under, um, under this, a lot of the ideas were not focusing on the production aspect per se. They were more on the, on the nutrition and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the food safety angle. And so it is through the gap analysis that, that all of these came up. So basically, in terms of small scale technology for smallholder farmers, um, what we are looking at, uh, including solar powered irrigation, issues with soil health, um, democrat democratizing precision agriculture, basically looking at all the technologies that farmers can use to, to do um, precision agriculture because there's so much information there. Um, we know that a lot of um, governments spend a lot of money on fertilizer subsidies. How can we increase the returns to that, to, to use that as an incentive for farmers to, 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 to improve their conditions of, of their soils. Also improving um, um, improved seed policy and practice for farmers to access um, and, and crop diversity um, solutions there. We also know that Many, many um, um, farmers in the food insecure areas or people who are food insecure, a lot of them are farmers that rely on crops that are not um, 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 are considered traditional crops in these fragile areas. For example, in the Sahel, we have farmers who rely on sorghum, millet, and, and teff, for example. And so what, what had, how can we improve their productivity because those um, crops are also very nutritious. We have game changing solutions on agricultural mechanization. And then we have another cluster area which we are looking to empower farmers, including um, um, African youth in agriculture, um, having an index based livestock insurance that can help, um, especially uh, pastoral farmers, uh, 
pastoral um, producers to, 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 to become more productive, but also providing um, 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 good practices on livestock um, production. We also have nutrition sensitive agriculture extension services. How can we link um, traditional um, agriculture? How can we link nutrition messages to that? Also looking at uh, the basic um, um, land rights issues, especially for, for, for women. But here we're also linking to, 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 to other action tracks. And then we have cross-cutting issues on gender in decision-making processes, because we know women play a big role in, in um, lots of decisions that, that happen on the farm. So whether it is improving productivity, whether it's in making food um, nutritious and also safe, we need, to, we need to be conscious and have specific um, actions um, directed at agenda, especially improving the equity in, in access to, to resources, et cetera. And then across this, we also have social protection issues, which are big, but we know, like I said, farmers, farmers, um, in, especially in, in developing countries, many of them who produce food for their own consumption do not produce enough. So they, they are also important in the social protection um, arena. Um, ending hunger um, and nourishing the, um, um, nourish the, the future fund, which is um, looking at ways to have um, a dedicated source of funding to, to, to support such, such farmers and also um, energy efficiency in terms of cold chains and, and linking that to infrastructure are very, very important. So this gives you an overview of several areas within Action Track 1 that are important, important for this forum. So let me end here. Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Um, I want to go now to the discuss to Action Track 2. Uh, that's uh, about um, sustainable consumption patterns and um, ask um, Ajay, Ajay Jakar, who is the chair of the Farmers Forum in India, uh, to, to, to make a presentation, uh, a summary presentation of the action track. Ajay, you, you have uh, four minutes, please. Thank you so much. Yeah. So action track two deals with shift to sustainable and healthy consumption patterns. Can we have slide number two, please? And slide number three. Yeah, that's right. So <clears throat> uh, the action track basically deals to a, aims to generate new and support existing game changing solutions that can catalyze shift in consumption through changes in food policy, food environment, public sector actions, and offerings and consumer behavior. A transition towards diets which are healthier, safer, and more nature positive from food systems which are economically equitable. As a farmer, I can tell you that uh, farmers grow not what they want, but farmers grow what consumers demand. That's what the market demands or what government incentivizes us. And so we grow looking at the demand, the pull factor. And uh, that's why Action Track 2 objectives become vital for evolving food systems. So when we started uh, discussions on this, we basically started with three headings where we compiled everything. One was food environments, which is to create healthy, safe, sustainable food environments to enable people to make and maintain healthy dietary practices. The second was food demand, which is to improve the product experience of healthier and more sustainable food and improve consumer motivation. Motivation Because you've got to change behavior, that's consumer motivation. And the last is to half food waste occurring across households, food service, and retail at all levels, including on the farm, so we can transition to a circular economy. Now, at the next stage, the action track two integrated its propositions with propositions from the other four action tracks. And can we have the next slide, please? And then we came up with, with uh, these action tracks, which were summarized into two. They were clustered into two. One is action track 2.1, which is enabling, inspiring, and motivating people to enjoy healthy and sustainable options. The other action track, as you can see on the screen is slashing food loss and waste and transacting to a circular economy. Action track 2.1 has, I will run through these points and we're here to answer questions when they come, is looking at formal and informal. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Yes, great. So 
if you look at 2.1 we are looking at formal and informal education strategies can be can we put this into the curriculum of schools so that people understand this uh, better and even at the same time media coverage of impact of food systems has been low so not only formal but informal education strategies school feeding programs are important and universally acknowledged as breastfeeding only 42% of the infants under 6 months are exclusively breastfed so if you, if you manage to change all that you manage to save 8 lakh 20000 children lives every year <clears throat> this is the data 54% of the population will be in cities so those are the epicenters we focus on we also focus on unhealthy and unsustainable consumption in high medium and high and and countries and which is also rapidly happening in low medium income countries which can be attributed to influence that the consumer that consumers are consu uh, consumers are consuming excessive consumption of unhealthy and sustainable food because of marketing practices how do you intervene and how do you get a package of practices to solve that problem labeling is one of the ways to do it very few people know and understand food and food is a cause of disease death undernutrition obesity climate change but front of pack labeling can help us uh, do look look into that I'll just take half a more minute and physical policy measures to how can we use taxation to tax unhealthy foods or or drinks high in uh, sugar salt and and unsaturated fat so these are these are different package of practices that can be used and if we come to the area of food waste which is the last point that i'm talking about is <clears throat> that we are looking at 150 countries committing to promise half food waste by 2030 and and why it's important is because one third of the food is lost and wasted on the farm and this food consumes one fourth of the world's fresh water used by agriculture occupies farmland greater than size of china and emits 8% of global greenhouse gases so we can actually save the planet if we are able to save the food and not waste it no food food is never waste and lastly we need to mobilize civil society and youth led initiatives we need to activate the activists and that's really important so we can pressurize governments and public uh, behavior and this is how we go ahead thank you so much i think so i've overshot my time edrado sorry for that Oh, uh, okay. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, we'll now move uh, to action track three, uh, like which is uh, boost nature positive uh, production. I will ask uh, Dr. Joao Campari, who is the global leader of WWF uh, Food Practice, um, to give us a short summary of where the action track work is. uh joao you have uh, uh your four minutes thank you very much and <laughs> thank I, you so and much i remind and i remind all that uh, we are i mean we please keep keep the time thank you very much i uh, i will be very brief eduardo thanks for having me here uh you know i'm first of all i'm delighted to be here because for action track 3 we talk about production nature positive production and we cannot talk about production without farmers and fishers in the room so uh, farmers and fishers are primary resource natural resource stewards and you know they need to be enabled to do their work and help deliver the uh, sustainable development goals so if you can go to the uh, to the next slide so that we can um, move somewhat fast you you can go to the next one please um You know, we depart in action track three. We depart from from the premise that our job is to help resolve three interconnect interconnected crises. Uh, it's the slide before that one, please. That says goals. Um, so the first crisis is biodiversity loss. The second one, and in no particular order, of course, is climate change, and uh, the third one is food insecurity. And uh, the way we produce food is is considered like. the side guys that keeps reinforcing this triple challenge and that stands between where we are today and the delivery of the SDGs the sustainable development goals no there it's no one's intention to vilify the food system because the food system does the job of nurturing um you know a very large uh, number of the planet's residents today but we cannot ignore the fact that about uh, 9% do not have access to to food 
at all. So uh, there are uh, parts of the food system, if, if not all of it, need to be transformed. And one of them is the way we produce um, uh, food. Therefore, we work um, in Action Track 3 with the, uh, you know, the purpose-driven goal to boost nature-positive production system at scale to globally meet the fundamental human right to healthy and nutritious food for all while operating within the planetary boundaries. We work uh, on three action areas um, to deliver these nature positive um, outcomes that we hope to achieve. The first one is to protect natural ecosystems from uh, conversion to food and feed production. The second one is to enable farmers and fishers and food producers and the food system uh, at all, uh, in, in all its entirety to sustain uh, to manage sustainably existing food production in land and water for the benefit of nature and people and the third um, area action area is to restore uh, degraded ecosystems and rehabilitate soil functions uh, at scale for sustainable food production the action area one on protect uh, we uh, work to propose ways and means to safeguard natural ecosystems from conversion and ensure the natural ecosystems uh, uh, are not converted for food and feed, actually. So here we uh, work to eliminate deforestation and conversion of natural habitats uh, and overfishing from food supply chains. The second action area aims to uh, design nature positive and co context specific solutions to increase input efficiencies, internalize externalities, increase yield sustainably within planetary boundaries, scale out uh, agroecology and agrobiodiversity uh, to reduce pressure on ecosystem services. And the third one, like I said, um, it, it's to restore uh, degraded ecosystems. So if you can move to the next one, I'll give you a flavor of some of the emerging solutions clusters, as we call it. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so you see in, in this slide, uh, the clusters of game-changing solutions that we have received in wave one, as Martin uh, clearly uh, stated at the beginning. And let me just have a few reflections. I mean, you have the full list here, but um, you know, we have we are nine harvests away if you're a farmer or a fisher from 2030. And I'd like you know to share what what I have been hearing here. So message number one is that we need to deforest less and restore more. Right? We must eliminate deforestation and conversion of natural ecosystems from food and feed and invest heavily on soil conservation and rehabilitation. The second message that I've been hearing uh, from the consultations with the global community is that we need to scale out uh, agroecology and other regenerative approaches. Uh, we have an action area in the middle here in the slide entirely dedicated to improving production systems. Um, here we have an explicit solution cluster on agroecology. We are we will probably uh, bring that together with re regenerative agriculture in a, in a single cluster. Um, and there, although there is a strong evidence to support these approaches, we have also been hearing that we need to significantly redirect research attention to better understand the potential of these models to reach scale, and significantly redirect agri-food support and subsidies to enable farmers and fishers everywhere to adopt such approaches. They are inclusive, they irradiate ecosystem services and other public goods everywhere, and therefore should be uh, properly rewarded and financed. The third message that we have been hearing uh, as we harvest the solutions uh, globally is that we need to promote agrobiodiversity. Let me say a word about that. Today, about 75% of our calories come uh, from 12 plants and five animals. And the global supply chains are organized around those. This puts huge pressures on natural ecosystems, stimulates deforestation and conversion of nature, uh, mostly due to monocrops, not to mention the impacts on human health. We need to move beyond these 12 plants and five animals. We need more like recognizing the value of what we call the forgotten food, uh, foods uh, that can diversify diets and do good for nature at the same time. We are discussing how companies, for example, can rethink their supply chains, uh, their supply chain architecture 
and work with suppliers to make this transition to more biodiverse products. Uh, the other message that I have been hearing, and I'll stop there, this, is, this will be my last one, I promise, is to strengthen the role of blue food when we talk about nature positive production. Uh, oceans and inland waters are the next frontier uh, in the supply of protein. And we need to pay attention uh, to them very closely across all action tracks. Uh, and we have formed a robust um, uh, solution cluster on that. So I just wanted to call out these four key messages to stimulate the discussion, but here you have the full, the full set. Um, thanks, uh, Eduardo. I'm gonna stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, you all. And uh, I, I, I will move now to, to action track four, uh, which is advancing equitable livelihoods. And I invite uh, uh, Dr. Christine Campo, uh, senior advancer of food systems uh, at CARE um, to provide us uh, with, a, with a short summary of, of uh, where the, the action track work is at this time. Um, I please re recall uh, the, the four minutes. Uh, we are already badly behind schedule, so please, uh, if you can help in, in keeping with, uh, with the time. Thank you very much. Uh, Sir, hi, Dr. Dwater. I promise I will even help us catch up on time. Thanks for inviting me to join you guys today. I'm, what I'm here for is to hear mostly from you as farmers. Action Track 4 is on livelihoods. I've spent the last 25 years as a female farmer in Southern Ontario working the land. It's unfortunate that my farmland is no longer in the hands of my family. In fact, the entire landscape has changed. Despite it being very fertile land, it's now covered with greenhouses worked by migrant workers who have little to no protection or rights. It blows my mind that the most underpaid, underexploited people around Earth exploited people around the world are those who grow our food, partially because of the seasonality of the work. But as you know, as farmers and producers, not, that's not the only reason. Um, as a farmer, you know what the challenges feel like. You know what the pain is when a crop <coughs> too, too much or too little water or something goes wrong at the wrong time. So we need to hear from your lived experiences, your know-how on how to shape the solutions. And again, action track four on livelihoods. Over a year ago, COVID-19 rocked our food systems. A few months ago, it was estimated that over half of the 3.3 global workforce were at risk of losing their jobs. That meant borders were closed, trade was restricted, confinement me measures were in place. That meant you couldn't buy seeds, you couldn't buy your inputs, you couldn't sell your produce. Many lost their source of income and returned to their, to their villages. So that's what Action Track 4 is looking at. If you would go to the next slide, please, and I will be brief as I go through them because I want to be hearing from you to help input what is missing. We have one solution cluster on rebalancing agency within food systems. You'll see some of the examples on the screen of we've received thousands and thousands of action of solutions as Action Track chairs, um, and, and they fall into categories like this. So improving social dialogue. What are the cooperatives that need to be in place to help small scale food producers come together and maximize their purchasing power and their selling power? What, what, what do gender transformative actions look like? Um, what do women need? <laughs> what, do, what, what do people, what do farmers, what do all these people across our food systems actually need to get not only a step up, but to really feel um, that power that they, they possess as, as food growers? Um, you can go to the next slide, please. In our section, second solution cluster, we have a lot of um, actions. We've received a lot of solutions about how do we keep back the unharmful practices like child labor and how do we make that better? How do we use those, those existing internationally agreed um, legislation to make sure that we're, we're, those who shouldn't be harmed aren't being harmed? Um, but also in, ex in exchange, how do we get those, how does everybody earn a decent, wage for the time they've worked and a decent price for the food that they've grown. Um, so that's what our second solution cluster is about and a lot of solutions are falling in there. If we go to our, my last slide, the third solution cluster is about, um, last slide please, thank you, localizing food systems and that's a bit more um, ha seed networks, farmers networks, agritourism is, is falling into there. So community social cards. That's, that's really about territorial approaches and how to make sure um, 
that we really take a look not only at global level, but what is really happening at local level and in these local food systems to make sure that farmers, small scale food producers, fisher folks, everybody working from fork to market or to shelf uh, has what they need to earn a life and a, and a, a wage with dignity and feed their families and themselves. That's it for me for today. Thank you. We're on mute, Eduardo. I'm sorry. Um, thank you very much uh, for helping us with the time. Uh, I would ask now um, Dr. Reid Anderson, Director General of the Private Sector Mechanism at the Key Committee for Food Security, um, to, to, to introduce us uh, with the situation in Action Track 5. Uh, Robin, please. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to follow on the heels of the other Action Track leaders, and particularly to echo Christine's comment. I am from a farm. I know uh, many people on this call, and, uh, and we are lucky to still be farming. But it's been very complicated times. And Action Track 5 is focused on what some of those complexities are particularly about food systems resilience. And Christine did speak to this question about some of the challenges that um, producers faced during COVID that the whole of the food system uh, faced. And how do we build up that resilience through integrative approaches, through multi-risk reductions, um, through universal food access, because as we know, more people than ever are going hungry following the COVID crisis. And climate resilience is another area that deeply affects farmers, and we've seen several comments about sustainability in the discussion so far today. Next slide. So as we begin to think about this, it's so important to have the farmer voice on these issues. And there are a whole series of activities um, mapped out in the Action Track 5 solutions. It includes things related to peace and security that are fundamental for farmers to be able to produce in all regions of the world. And uh, sometimes that might seem further than uh, for some of us in North America, but even our brethren in other parts of the Americas have had issues with this. And all of the world faces moments where we can be affected by drought, by challenges um, such as uh, insecurities created through instabilities in any part of the system. So these solutions are really built out to think about how we can address those globally, but also there are roles for producers and farmers to play. So we welcome your input into frontline solutions to address the challenges you experienced in COVID, or the ways in which you can achieve greater climate resiliency as examples. Next slide, please. And with that, as a farmer in the, uh, in the process, I can tell you that um, one of the things that's most important, even in this critical seeding time um, or harvest time, if you're uh, on the other side of the equator, that this is really a a moment when we need to hear from farmers. And though I know this comes at a time when all of you are busy, we do encourage all of you to get engaged in this process. And we're looking forward to some of the questions we'll be having from all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ravine. Uh, so uh, we mm, almost uh, made it. We are, uh, well, we are about 15 minutes late, but uh, we do have some time now for for discussion and um i i do have a number of questions that has been uh, posted from the question and answer which i think it uh, would be interesting to 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 take up at this time and um i have a, a two or three questions which are related to um probably best to to Marty to respond um the first one is, uh, uh, how do you envision the, the implementation process of the action changing uh, activities that are being uh, identified uh, or the action change solutions after 
the September meeting. So what will happen after September uh, with this? Uh, how do you ambition the um, implementation of uh, what is being identified uh, at this time? Um, Martin? Then I will ask Great. a couple of follow-up questions, uh, which are a couple of questions which I think fit as follow-up of, uh, of, of this question. Great. I will be very short in my answer to give time for more answers. Um, one bit of follow-up to the summit <clears throat> is what we are seeing in 112 countries now, where, where multi-stakeholder dialogues are taking place, where communities are coming together to build pathways for the 2030 agenda. So much of the action will be national, will be reformed legislation, national platforms, and so on. On a global level with the action tracks, we are building coalitions now around a whole set of game-changing solutions as they were presented by the action tracks right now. And we are not possessive of them. We are inviting everybody in to be a part of these coalitions, and we very much hope that they develop a life on its own. Some of them are covered and pushed by member states very strongly. Um, think about school feeding, for example, where you have um, Finland or France behind it. Um, in other areas, such as blue food, there are some um, already existing coalitions that can be coming in. And I think that's a fundamental part that not everything we are doing needs to be brand new and reinvented, um, but that the existing coalitions, that the existing work finding together and are really being put in a food systems perspective so that this, and I think that's the biggest thing that this summit can do, the breaking of the silos to bring the different communities together so that this is moving forward. And when we are talking about a COVID response, people understand the central importance of nutrition. And when we are building national action plans towards the 2030 agenda, that it's not only in the hands of ministers of agriculture, um, but that we see the broad importance of those. So in short, all of these coalitions will have lead people with a bit of capacity to drive them forward and we see that as a start point in the um, process, and the summit is certainly not an end point. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Martin. Um, the, the the second question, or there's a couple of questions which I will combine. It's uh, how can we access all the two thousand um game changers uh, solutions that um, that you refer to in in your presentation and i would let me sort of bring in together with that uh, question uh, a, a, a second one which i think is very pertinent uh, to, to to this meeting and the question is it's whether the farmers whether farmers are being involved in the in, in the selection of uh, of the ideas that uh, that will continue uh, from those two south and the sort of refinement whether the farmers have been involved in the refinement of those two thousand ideas into the ones that will continue into the future for the implementation pieces and and stressing that uh, uh, that would be essential to to really choose ideas that are doable at the farm level and and i think that that's a very interesting uh, proposition and uh, your your comments on, on that would be welcome. Well, as I said, in all of the propositions, we didn't rule out propositions. We didn't take solutions and say, um, this is what we are not following. We try to bring together the different solutions with their communities behind them um, in order to drive that change. All change is local and it has to work in a local context, it has to work in a national context. So one big plea is also um, the interaction between the action tracks and the country level dialogues. And we have these integration now going on that when the national level dialogues are happening, farmers and others who are part of these dialogues can push for certain solutions. And we have an ongoing discussion. I put it a little bit earlier in the chat box on foodsystems.community 
on the different um, solutions that can be refined in a way that it really works for the farmers. And it's very, very context specific. I've seen questions in the chat box, for example, on holistic grazing. Um, there are many um, solutions that are specific to a context. And it's important to understand that we see our offering really as a menu of solutions. And it is not that, you know, it is the same in every country, in every piece of the world, but you can really select which one works best and go with these. But on the broader level, on um, how these solutions function, whether they work on a farm level, this is really in the food systems community um, that we are happy for your feedback and can, we can refine further. Well, thank you very much. Um, now we have um, a couple of questions which are more specific on, 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 on given uh, one, which is a mixture of comment and, uh, and question which is um, making the, the sort of referring about oils and uh, stressing the, the perspective that uh, seed oils uh, are harmful for, to human health. And then sort of asking the concern of why are they being promoted uh, uh, here, um, either to Martin or to any of the other um, production leader participants. I mean, actual drugs uh, participants. Is that question relating to the presentation we have seen earlier on oil palms and um, vegetable oil production? Must, must be, must be, sure. Yeah. Well, I was seeing half of this presentation and I don't know whether the gentleman who gave it is still there and can come in. But, you know, for me, a big learning bit is that in all of these very controversial issues, we are seeing a more nuanced debate. And this is what we need. For example, when you look into nutrition, people normally think that everything fresh is good and everything that is processed is bad. That's not necessarily the case. There is simple food processing, like putting tomatoes in a can, that is actually not impacting on the nutrition's value. So we, know on the other side that super processed ready-made meals are full of trans fat and full of salt and they are not good and it's the same thing with the discussion around meat it is ridiculously um, simplifying if you say meat or no meat it has to be good meat it has to be um, organically sustainably produced meat meat can even be a solution when it's coming to land restoration when you're working on grasslands. And I'm not an expert on oil palms, but I make this point because I want to say, and that was so interesting in the presentation from Colombia, that just the very fact that you are working on oil palms doesn't necessarily make it a bad solution. It is about the context specificity. It's about the how that you are doing things. things. And I think, you know, in moving this food systems conversation forward, we all need to listen to each other and sometimes come out of the trenches of our very strong opinions to actually find the middle ground, to find the solutions going forward. This is how I, how I have understood the presentation on the oil production, but of course, you know, the presenter is in a much better place to talk to that. No, uh, I don't know if Jens is uh, still, still around. I want to comment on on this, Jens. Thank you, Eduardo. And thank you to Martin. I completely agree. The thing is the context and how we do things. But uh, for example, the current debate in Europe that they are uh, in a way stigmatizing uh, palm oil as a, 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 that is not good for many reasons. I think that's a wrong approach because palm oil can be very good. The same thing with many other agricultural products, but it all depends in how you do things and what is the context, because it's not the same talking about one crop in a country like Colombia or other crops in the, even in the same context of Colombia. Uh, we are a tropical country 
We have possibilities for certain crops, but not for others. And the same happens to many other countries. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, one last uh, question, which I think it deserves to, to, to be touched because it's, um, it's a big issue, I guess, in the discussion of the Food Systems Summit, although Martin sort of has already touched on the issue. Uh, there is a question stressing in the first part, stressing uh, when, when, that when grazed properly, Livestock uh, is extremely beneficial for the environment and climate, something that uh, Martin has stressed and that there's ample, ample evidence, particularly in some parts of, uh, of Latin America, uh, where there is uh, scientific evidence about this. Um, unfortunately, there is uh, a lot of uh, misinformation about this and how uh, this, uh, how can it be done? The question particularly is what can be done to refute the misguided the eat less meat message uh, and accelerate the global adoption uh, of holistic planning and other, and other production strategies which are uh, beneficial for the environment. Uh, you, want some, you have already commented on this uh, uh, Martin, but uh, if you do have uh, an additional comment, uh, you're welcome. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next session. Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks. Eduardo, if I may just say a word or two about that. I mean, you know, when we talk about livestock um, and uh, meat consumption and nutrition, we enter an area that needs to be, the conversation needs to be more nuanced than we have today. You know, it's not by, uh, you know, stop eating something or continue to eat so eating something. It's not going to resolve the environmental crisis. So we, the conversation needs to be more nuanced than we are hoping to have this in the food system uh, summit action across action tracks. Actually, one of the emerging uh, clusters uh, of solutions that is coming up is that the role of grasslands. You know, every time we talk about um, livestock production, we tend to think about removing forests to plant pastures and raising cattle. But there are other very important biomes uh, for food production that relates to livestock production, like the U.S. Great Pl uh, uh, Northern Great Plains or the Pampas here in South America or the Llanos uh, in Colombia. There are places where grazers and um, uh, ecology work together, right? So, and when we talk uh, about the consumption of meat, it's not the consumption, it's the overconsumption that, you know, impacts human health. Uh, it's the overconsumption that may drive deforestation in certain places. So there are places in the world, very important ones, that we're not talking sufficiently about um, that should be part of this conversation. And we have in action track three, uh, one of the clusters uh, for the solution space is to understand better the role of grazers uh, and grasslands and savannas and pastoralists with the livelihoods. So we do have the space for this conversation to happen. And when we raise the profile of grasslands and savannas in global conservation efforts, we can, uh, animals are part of, of the solution here. So um, AJ, I, you are from Action Track uh, too. I don't know if you want to complement or bring new uh, insights into this, but the conversation uh, is a nuanced <clears throat> one that we're proposing to have. Thank you. And uh, I think so, I, I, I agree with Zhao, it's a nuanced, conversation and regarding uh, the question that Carl has put there's another point that he's put is that why I think so he's tending to say is why are we saying eat less meat it's not for the whole planet what we have seen is that high income countries are currently consuming double the recommended day, daily intake of animal products surpassing nutritional requirements uh, and low medium income countries are following on the same pathways so we've got to stop this becoming even a bigger problem and that's that's why the focus is on changing to healthy diets moving away from unhealthy diets and that adds to the nuanced conversation that 
it's not meat eating that is bad it's over consumption of a particular item in your diet which is bad but i'm happy to engage with this i'll put my email address in the in the chat if anybody wants to reach out to me reach out to action drag we will be happy to engage with you all thank you well well before we move on uh to the to the dialogue uh, i don't know if uh, some of the other action tracks i uh, want to take the floor about uh, some of the of the questions that uh, have been posted uh, they are welcome if not uh, we'll have uh, further opportunities uh, down the agenda so um if um, if not uh, we move on in the agenda uh late but we finally move on we are about 18 minutes late um we move on to uh, an update on the food system summit dialogues uh, which we presented by florence that's ben the manager and director or for sd uh please uh, florence Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trico. Uh, I'm indeed Florence Lasben, the Managing Director of the support team of the Food System Summit Dialogues. Uh, happy to provide sorry. a quick update. No problem. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank I you. should have thank known <laughs> for 4 I mean, I should have known. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for that. No problem. No problem at all. 4SD is actually the entity that has been hired to support the, the, the dialogues. There was nothing wrong in what you've said, Dr. Trigo. Um, so yes, uh, Agnes Calibata, the special envoy of the for the summit, has uh, invited Food System Summit dialogues to take place all around the world. Uh, food System dialogues are meant to be structured and carefully curated meetings where participants are not just passive, but engaged to share their own perspectives and listen to each other, as Martin was uh, reminding us uh, the, the, the importance to listen to each other, to appreciate the perspectives of each other when we want to work together uh, to shift uh, food systems. So these Food System Summit dialogues are organized by either member states who have all been invited to engage in this process. Uh, I'm sorry to contradict Martin, it's not only 112, it's 114 governments uh, who have officially engaged into the process. More governments are joining every day, reason why we don't all have the same number. Uh, but the big uh, trend is that uh, most member states want to be part of this process. Member states nominate uh, officially a convener to lead the national process. Most of the conveners uh, have been uh, nominated from ministries of agriculture, but all of them uh, are looking at ways to engage other sectors and other departments to shape uh, the dialogues process in their countries. The other half of the conveners are not coming from ministries of agriculture, but either from uh, prime minister's office or from um, um, entities which are uh, made to look across uh, all sectors in government. Uh, um, and some of them are coming from uh, the, the environment uh, sector or the health sector. So again, governments uh, with their nominations of conveners uh, show us that they are looking at food systems from different angles uh, with this uh, dialogue process. Most uh, member states uh, organize three phases of dialogues. They first uh, organize the first dialogue to, to initiate the process, to explain uh, the opportunity that is offered uh, by this method uh, to prepare the food system summit. And then they uh, engage more dialogues to explain explore locally what are the specificities of the food systems, what are the uh, um, actions that need to be taken uh, to change um, uh, the, the, the food systems and um, improve uh, the impact uh, of actions uh, across all the SDGs. And the third phase of their dialogue is to consolidate all their uh, findings uh, and prepare the path, their pathways to 2030 and their intentions and commitments uh, to be made at the summit in September. 
As I was saying, uh, to date, 114 governments have engaged into the process. Uh, um, most of them flag challenges for being inclusive. Uh, challenges because of COVID, um, creating situations where physical dialogues might be difficult. Uh, so most of the dialogues are organized online. What is interesting uh, for, for you uh, here to, to, to hear probably is that most conveners are really concerned and look for ways to engage farmers despite these constraints created by the COVID situation. Most of them after their first dialogue really look at uh, the, the diversity of the stakeholders who were involved, take stock on this and explore how to be more inclusive in the next stages of their dialogues. It's not perfect and I'm sure you have solutions or ideas to suggest to the national conveners. I just wanted to stress uh, how important it is to them to engage with farmers. The, not only member states are invited to organize dialogues, but actually everybody, anybody can convene an independent dialogue. Any of you can decide to organize and uh, convene, convene an, an independent food system summit dialogues. To date, 330 are already announced, um, independent dialogues are already announced. Uh, 200 have taken place. A lot of them have been organized by farmers actually. Uh, or farmers' organizations. The independent dialogues are a great opportunity uh, to set the agenda of the dialogue, to identify yourself, the stakeholders you want to uh, talk to, uh, to explore the options and uh, the pathways for the future of our food systems. What we see more and more, it's also member states uh, and national conveners looking and engaging with the independent conveners, with the independent dialogues, because they've spotted the richness of what is coming out of the independent dialogues and they want to enrich their thinking, um, their process to elaborate their pathway um, informed by um, the independent dialogues that are taking place in their own countries. These independent dialogues, they can uh, happen at a very localized place. We've seen some of them at the scale of a village. Some of them are taking place at a subnational level, provincial, region, depending country per country. Some others are looking at the commonalities between several countries and uh, are, are engaging stakeholders at a regional, geographical, regional level. And last but not least, there's also some global summit dialogues that are organized and co-convened by Agnes Kalibata herself, who is another partner to bridge uh, communities who are focusing on topics that are related to food without necessarily being at the center of our thinking, namely water. There was a global dialogue on water a few days ago uh, with the intention to bridge the people who are working on water with those uh, who are focusing on food and make sure that no one uh, is forgetting the other. There's more global dialogues to come. Uh, there is one on environment that is getting prepared. There's one on aquatic foods uh, that is also in the making. And later on, there will be one uh, focusing on um, cities and how cities can also have an active role uh, to uh, um, change food systems, uh, transform food systems. A lot of opportunities uh, for you to engage into these dialogues, uh, for you to have a seat at the table of the preparation of the Food System Summit. Um, each dialogue is followed by a report uh, that is uh, using an official feedback form um, that is standardized uh, across all of the dialogues. Um, these uh, feedback forms are actually used by the action tracks and the other uh, work streams that are preparing the summit uh, to inform, uh, sorry, to inform uh, their uh, deliberation and uh, their work uh, advancing, being especially um, connected to the local um, uh, challenges uh, to transform food systems. I will leave it there. I thank uh, colleagues who have posted in the chat uh, the links where you can find more information about the dialogues. Leave it there, Dr. Trigo, but happy to take some questions if there are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
thank you very much. And uh, we'll now move to um, the more uh, questions and, uh, and uh, question and answers. Um, uh, we we do have uh, uh, a couple of uh, comments and, and, and questions, which I think it's uh, important to take up at this time. Um, it's been brought up the issue of the investments and um, the, the issue of investments and uh, that uh, and, and, and the fact that uh, without investments, additional investments, uh, implementing change in, in many situations uh, would not be possible. Um, and the, the, the emerging question is, uh, what is being foreseen within the, the food system discussion about the investments, uh, the investment issue in terms of uh, getting the changes uh, that are being foreseen as uh, necessary uh, into place? Uh, and this is an open question uh, to the action tracks, Martin, or uh, what, what is uh, perspiring from the dialogues uh, in, in your case, uh, Florence. Thank you very much. I mean, any, anyone, it, it's an open question uh, to, to anyone. If I can <clears throat> maybe start off. Um, the most important action there is, is to talk and to connect and basically be prepared to be surprised. You know, I, I've been now in this process for a bit more than a year. And I've heard chief executive officer from big companies. And if I closed my eyes, they sound like environmental activists. I've heard um, ambassadors speaking like chief executives. I hear heard farmers speaking like scientists. You are often surprised what you hear from now. And my plea to all of the community is, um, it's a very simple one. We all want to work and we want to live on this planet. I think very few people out there are really evil, but there is so much demonization from different sides. There is so much antagonism. And I think if we can manage to sit together and speak about the issues that are important for us, um, it's astonishing what's happening. Um, in a previous meeting today, for example, we were speaking about the game changes that are needed to give people better access to nutritious food. Now, you know, many things come to mind, but one of the panelists said what we really need is universal electrification. You hear me right. We need access to electricity for everyone. So that particularly in developing countries where women often cook, they are not exposed to the fumes of open fire. They can process nutritious food, they can cook, um, which would not be the case. Now, you know, this makes sense, but a person like myself, I have been working 15 years on climate change. We have been pushing for universal electrification from a different perspective, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce the emissions of black sooth. So I think the whole potential that we have at hand with this summit is really the community building. This is the most important piece. And to listen to each other and to find out what other people in areas that are seemingly not interesting for us have to say, because it is most relevant. And we are living in an incredibly complex, interdependent and complicated world. And sometimes it's overwhelming. But what I want to say, and that makes me so happy when Florence says that some of the independent dialogues are going down to the village level, because the complexity is actually solvable when you are looking at the landscapes, when you are bringing the people together around a piece of degraded land in you know, sub saharan Africa. If you speak to the local kindergarten and ask um, for their nutritious needs, if you close the gap between the local farmer and the local consumers. If you bring the information, if you work on extension services that have been crossly neglected over many years, I think um, there's this wonderful saying that to every problem, there's a simple solution that happens <clears throat> to be wrong. And 
we need to lean into the complicated solutions. We need to um, acknowledge all the different shades between black and white. If we want to find these solutions, we have to understand that they are context specific and that they are dynamic. What worked 20 years ago might not work today. And what we are coming up with today might just be outdated in 10 years. So this complexity, this no simple answers is something that often gets lost in a time where, you know, much of our reality is people shouting on top of each other on social media, but we need to have the patience to listen and even to adjust our own opinions. And um, with that, back to you, Dr. Trigo. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, now, let me sort of uh, uh, introduce a question which, uh, to, to all the, the group we are at that level of the meeting already at that level of the meeting, uh, to all to you and, and, and all the action tracks uh, participants. Uh, there has been criticism at different levels that the summit is not addressing uh, the need of the small farmers and or the disadvantaged uh, groups in, in, in the farming community. And uh, which in, in a way that the discussion is leaning toward certain interests, quote unquote, between the, the food system. Um, I think it would be very important for, to share uh, your thoughts uh, on this issue, uh, particularly since uh, in our region, uh, small farming, it's, it's a large uh, part of our agriculture and, and it is a concern. Um, so um, I would like, I, I would put that question on the table for comment from you or from any other of the, of the action tracks, uh, um, people participating in the meeting. Thank you. Uh, I think I better, okay. So, uh, yeah, I just want to add this question to something that's in the, in the Q and A. And this is a question by Ed, which goes something like uh, to where you are pointing. It says that farmers are well aware of leading nature-based farmers and researchers working with farmers, yet none of these leaders have been invited to a presentation. You know, so it makes him, uh, uh, the word he uses is leery of the process. I think it's not like that. Uh, we have Vijay, who's the vice chair of the Champions Group on Production, responsible for agroecology and shifting 1.5 million farmers in one state of India. And he's the, he's the vice chair. He was presenting in the first public forum, uh, producers public forum, which I moderated. So it's, it's not like that. The voices of farmers, especially of small farmers, their issues are being addressed. And I think so they're very evident when you look at the solutions or do documents, which are also all available on, on, on the website. It's just an example to address one particular question, which, which also, had the same problem, uh, which which address uh, which focused on 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 a problem that he thought was a problem, but I don't think so. It's a problem. Thank you. And maybe I can add to that. Um, I learned once, you know, in a previous life, I was a diplomat. That in diplomacy, it's five percent what you do, and it's ninety-five percent how you are being perceived. And just as we started to build this summit, we were hit with COVID. And we are working with a team that has never met in person. That costed us a couple of months. So in the public perception, there was a big announcement by the Secretary General, there is a food system summit coming. And then it went silent over several months. And in these several months, rumors were cooking up high. Why don't we hear about the food system summit? It's all cooked behind closed doors and what have you. It is not. It is a big and complicated and slow process. And it is, no, actually it's not slow. I've been in the climate negotiations um, that took 25 years to come with an agreement that is slow. We have been in one year building up a massive machine with only one purpose. And that's a giant ear to listen what you have to say. But that takes time. And that needs so many of those conversations to bring people on board to address anxieties, issues where people believe, oh, it doesn't even make sense if I raise my voice because everything is already decided. Nothing is decided. 
Just earlier today, we had a meeting with the chair of our board, the deputy secretary general, and just to inform her what we have heard so far. And you know, all of the action tracks and the um, dialogue process have duly reported what we are hearing. And these are the issues. So if you are concerned about what this summit brings, there's only one way. Go in, engage with us, tell us what your issues are, tell us about your experiences, um, give us game-changing solutions <clears throat> that we can build in. <clears throat> and you know, when we are saying game-changing solutions, sometimes it sounds like the latest gadgets, the piece of digital um, device or whatever. That's not what we mean, you know, we mean everything that works. I'm coming out of the climate process, as I said, and in 2017, sorry, in 2017, indeed, Fiji had the presidency and they brought their Talanoa process, which is a traditional um, process in the South Pacific on bringing people together for collective um, finding of solutions. That was an innovation and it really worked, you know. Sometimes it's the traditional knowledge that is the breakthrough. It's the things that we forgot to do. Um, and this is what we need. We are only the custodians of the substance that our constituencies are bringing to us. And that is the, invita the invitation I have to do um, and I'm, I'm bringing to all of you and the innovation of this UN Food System Summit <clears throat> because it is to a point co-led by all walks of global society um, that even sometimes member states feel they are not enough in the driver's seat. But it's again, it's not a negotiation summit. It's not the classical point where ambassadors and ministers come together to create new norms. We have the norm, we have the sustainable development goals. Our challenge is to make it happen to transform that into action. And that only works with a big community here. So this is, you know, and for anyone um, who is criticizing this summit process, I would challenge that person and say, prove it, try to come in, make your voice heard. And if we don't open the door, if we don't listen to you, then you really have grounds to criticize. Um, but our doors are open and again, it's a hard job for the action tracks with small teams for the summit dialogue team to reach out to ultimately more than 7 billion people, you know, we are not that big a team. So we are always depending on people who are multiplying, connecting with their communities, spreading the word, telling their folks, actually, this is worthwhile engaging with, give it a try, let's be a part of that. So that's my take on the inclusiveness. The readiness is there from our side. We are all acting in best faith. And you know, I've been in this process a bit more over a year. I didn't have any undecent call by any company trying to push us in any direction. And I'm you know, just inviting you to come in and be part of the conversation. Eduardo, can I come in quickly on that, please? You are on mute, Eduardo. Sorry. I think that was an over to you, Joe. Oh yeah. Okay. Thank you. I I could not hear him, so I'm <laughs> I'm trying. So uh, in action track, yeah, th thanks, Robin. In action track three, um, we have the World, uh, World Farmers Organization in our leadership team. They submitted many uh, game changers, more than 25 for sure. Uh, we also have the Asia Farmers uh, Association who submitted a game changer that is amazing on scaling out agroecology, especially for small farmers. So this, it's a really wonderful game changer to work with. Um, VJ just mentioned, but uh, AJ just mentioned, but we are also working with VJ Kuma on the zero budget natural farming, who has been attracting a lot of attention and doing amazing work in central India. And there is one um, uh, cluster that is really, really interesting that we're trying to really scale and bring more voices around the table is on indigenous people's food systems, because traditional knowledge 
of indigenous populations uh, based on their rights, on a biocentric vision is super important for the work that we do on Action Track 3. So, um, you know, uh, and like Martin said, the doors are really open. And I would also, I would also encourage member states to um, come forward and bring, bring the voices of those uh, underrepresented groups in their societies to join Action Track 3 and join the work of all other Action Tracks um, as well. So it's super important uh, to you know, bring farmers, ranchers, fishers into this work, especially the small ones who may not have the capacity to join directly, but via their associations. So um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Eduardo, over to you. You're on mute. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Joao. Uh, very, very clear. Uh, anyone else uh, wants uh, to comment on, on, on this issue? On, uh, uh, well, um, this is Anne. I would like to comment, please. Yes. Um, please go ahead, this Anne. is Anne May, representing um, U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action. And um, we worked hard to put together a report uh, a year ago uh, entitled U.S. Agriculture's Opportunity to Contribute to the Sustainable Development Goals. And so we are uh, trying to educate U.S. farmers how our contribution can align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And um, I'll have someone from the staff put in the chat uh, a link to that report. So um, again, just trying to educate producers and farmers on what our contribution can be. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, well, um, I don't know. Uh, Everybody has access to the question and uh, question and answers uh, box. If um, if uh, anyone from the from the panel from the action tract uh, wants to comment on, on on some of the questions that have been posted there, uh, I think that most of them uh, which have not been touched are really comments rather than than questions. Uh, I find some of them quite interesting, but uh, I have no no idea how to translate them into questions, really. Uh, but in any case, um, if anyone, before we move to to the wrap up and the next steps, uh, if uh, anyone uh, wants to to make a comment on on the comments or on, on some of the questions uh, which uh, have not been touched, although I think we touched uh, on most. Uh, uh, the, 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 the time is now. Um, anyone? Yeah, it's just one comment from me, Eduardo, because I see um, the second time uh, a question about how we design solutions. And the first, <clears throat> although we have <clears throat> global problems, the solutions packages that we are designing needs to be localized. They need to be context specific. And I particularly appreciate uh, the comment uh, that came from Ambassador uh, Kip Tom. I mean, that was spot on. I responded on the chat. And I see another one here coming from Jack Frosey on the uh, Q&A. Absolutely. I mean, we do have global problems, but you know, each country, each region, each municipality, if you will, each context can contribute to that. And the solutions that are be, that we aim to design, I mean, we don't aim to design, we hear them, need to be con uh, context specific. So um, you are right on with that. I just wanted to make uh, that clear uh, to this group. Thank you, Eduardo. Well, thank you very much, uh, Joao. And uh, well, um, I think that uh, that's about it. Uh, we we should move to the wrap up, and uh, there is uh, nothing more for me to than uh, to thank you all. I, I think it's been a very lively discussion, and we have touched 
on on a number of sensitive and uh, and uh, and relevant issues uh, for for the food su summit uh, and 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 more than the food summit uh, for the objectives of the food summit. I, I mean, it's uh, I I think it's uh, a lot for. Uh, I mean, from this discussion, uh, it, it should uh, we come out with a lot to to reflect and uh, emphasizing that uh, really the summit it's a it's a, it's a people's uh, discussion. I mean, and, and it's not so much uh, how uh, there is a, a, a space for for people to participate, but the really to people the, the decision from people to participate in the process, and uh, and I think that that's clearly uh, put out there, and, uh, and 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 that's something that uh, we need to reflect in in how each of our can contribute to the overall objective. Uh, I, I I would like to to thank everybody for the participation, the patience, with the moderation, and unfortunately we have a little bit of mishaps at the at the beginning, and Dr. Kalibata could not be with us, uh, but it's surely understandable given the, the, the nature of the challenge that, that she had ahead, uh, she has ahead of her, and. Um, I just uh, want to stress that uh, everybody uh, of those questions that have not been uh, specifically touched upon, uh, I mean, it is committed to, that uh, every participant will receive a, a, an answer to those questions um, in, the, in the weeks to come. And um, I also stress to, to everybody to, 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 to check uh, periodically on the inform on the website and other and, and other uh, uh, social media challenge uh, channels of the food system for the um, for the information of how the different activities that we have been reviewing uh, today are evolving. Uh, certainly, in, in in the dialogues, uh, I mean, there is uh, ample opportunity. To participate and get involved in in the discussions and uh, and as we have seen, so those discussions are an essential part of the process and will eventually impact on on, on what the, the products and the and the roadmap for the transformation of the system uh, will eventually look like. Uh, with that, I would thank um, everybody, the organizers, and I would uh, really. Uh, thank uh, Shishuan and Alison and everybody, uh, Oliver, uh, for for having me in in, in the moderation. It's uh, it's been a pleasure to to contribute uh, in this uh, small way, and and I think that that's that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Goodbye. Okay, bye. Bye to everybody. build back stronger than ever. Transforming our food systems is possible and necessary. And we can set a course to make real change for the benefit of all people by bringing together key players from around the world and giving voice to citizens in every country. Because a strong food system means no matter your race, no matter your class, no matter where you Women and men have equal opportunities to produce and access nutritious food.
which promotes human health at every step without degrading land and water resources. Significa una agricultura familiar provide us the community with stability all year round, every month, every day of the week, even during a pandemic. We are all connected and we all have a responsibility to act. We must be bold. We must think and act differently. Transforming our food systems is the most powerful action we can take to solve our biggest problems. Because together, we can build a just a resilient world. Yes, and we feel in the world where no one's left behind. Where no one is left behind. Where no one is left behind, where no one is left behind. Join us today. Thank you, Audra. Thank you all.